So basically our, our previous uh, series was on distributed autonomy uh, and it featured uh, uh, Ray Maddocky at the Navy Postgraduate School, Dave Jakes at uh, Air Force Institute of Technology and Azad Madni at USC uh, who have been collaborating on uh, uh, coordinating swarms of drones in, in, in uh, uh, airborne activities and uh, using some of Azad's AI uh, uh, approaches to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the, the system would be continuing to learn about the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the adversary and, uh, and uh, pass that back to Dave and, and Ray and, and, uh, and have, have them coordinate the swarms of drones. Uh, uh, one of the things that we uh, didn't really realize was that uh, th this is just uh, the uh, uh, simplest uh, uh, of this kind of form uh, in, in that uh, we had no uh, 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 addressal of, of the fact that uh, your adversary is going to be trying to mess around with you. And uh, so fortunately, this series that we're doing uh, now is uh, going to uh, begin with Joe Matella, who has been uh, addressing not just autonomy, but uh, uh, cyber autonomy uh, and uh, how to uh, 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 address the challenges that you, you run there. So, uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, Joe, uh, who has been uh, addressing these things for quite some years, uh, uh, we're looking forward to your talk. So uh, uh, we'll go for it. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. And uh, just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Uh, Barry, Tom. Yep. yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Super. So uh, as I said, it's a delight to be here. Now I'm going to be uh, mentioning uh, so this is an ENSCO slide, and I am their chief technologist at the Aerospace Sciences and Engineering Division in Cocoa Beach. Uh, I, and I also support the Air Force via a contract. But what I'm about to say is uh, mine. I did not preview a script with anybody. So these are um, strictly my words. If you, uh, if you um, like them, <laughs> like what I have to say, then uh, thank everybody. But if uh, you don't like something, then just blame me and, uh, and, and that'll take care of that. So I would like to begin my talk with uh, some motivation on autonomous cyber physical systems and then get to the hardware software foundations of trust. And trust is, uh, as I think somebody said in a, in a, in a note a minute ago, uh, trust is a, a human kind of a thing. So uh, we're going to be treading on the interface between humans and machines. And the mathematical structure of hardware and software that we rely on leads us into a, a, a domain of computing called data flow computing, which has tremendous capabilities for uh, cybersecurity, but also presents challenges. And uh, in particular, uh, integrating the larger uh, data flow and self-awareness and other features that are needed for computationally autonomous uh, devices uh, provide some systems engineering challenges. I think we're going to need some new processes. I think there are some great opportunities for systems engineering uh, in general and the CERC in particular. On slide five, I uh, have um, some extracts, uh, pieces of video from Angel Has Fallen. Uh, how many of you have seen Angel Has Fallen? <laughs> so there's a <clears throat> little Q&A out there to get a sense of my audience. Um, I'm, I'm not allowed to vote, uh, so I'll just put that away, but it'll be fun to see how many of you have actually seen the movie. So in the movie, there are some very realistic things, face recognition, and then uh, if you look at the numbers of, swar uh, numbers of uh, devices that are flying around, uh, it's a fairly large swarm, looked to me like uh, about 100 vehicles, the devices look at a face. They're able to connect via maybe some uh, multi-tenant edge computing, to use the 5G term MEC, which I'll use uh, more than once in the rest of this slide. And then it uh, looks like about uh, 
not, not, not many of you have seen it. So it's a good movie, uh, and it's, it's worth watching to um, take a look at the degree of realism and the interplay of machines and people and how the people try to outsmart the machines. It's a real little mini study in uh, autonomy. And uh, now these, these vehicles are indep independently autonomous. They know how to fly themselves around and blow things up. Uh, but then when it comes to uh, the larger network and the goals and all the rest of it, it's a very, uh, very interesting movie. So the, uh, the networking part, in order to make this actually happen in the real world, you'd have to have significant wireless networking from the individual devices and uh, among the various other uh, elements. And now the, the pyrotechnics shown in the lower right are pure Hollywood, <laughs> these little guys would be able to make that big a kaboom, but uh, even a small uh, widget uh, hitting you in the head at high speed with uh, no kinetics on board uh, would hurt. So let's see. So, so my, there we go. Um, autonomy in weapons systems has been around for a long time. Of course, cruise missiles were the first uh, autonomous um, weapons per se. Uh, and they've been around forever. In 2014, I, w I participated in a workshop on autonomy at the University of uh, Florida and uh, went online and discovered that there were these three weapons, a uh, tank, a machine gun, and a breaching uh, machine that were available for sale. Mm, a couple hundred K would buy you that tank in the upper left. It's really a remotely piloted vehicle but when you, get, when you pilot it to where you wanted it to be, you could give it a sector and tell it, okay, if anything moves in this sector, uh, shoot to kill or whatever the specific uh, tasking is. So as these, and that was in 2014, so as these levels of capability are increasing of the computational intelligence in these devices, the autonomy is increasing and the autonomy in the weapons uh, are increasing but the environments are complicated by, especially if you think about the Angel, uh, what about EW Cyber? And they, they blow up the president's airplane, but it would be pretty amazing if the president, uh, president wasn't protected by some kind of sensing of the EW environment. In particular, Army Field Manual 3-38 says uh, is about cyber electromagnetic activities, and it describes how management of the radio spectrum electronic warfare and cyberspace operations are uh, basically an, uh, an integrated whole. The complexity of these environments is indicated by these slides that I just downloaded from the internet uh, with, with, a, with a query that had to do with uh, uh, weapons and so forth. And so you'll see uh, spacecraft at the top and submarines uh, in the water and under the water and uh, lots of vehicles on land. So the, the, the battle manager in the lower right is trying to figure out uh, what to, how to task his autonomous vehicles and who should be asked to do what in terms of controlling uh, other vehicles. And now that we have the Space Force, the guy in the upper left may well be uh, in uh, outer space trying to um, win that part of the war or at least to orchestrate what's going on there to the benefit of whatever the kinetic engagement is on the uh, on the, in the more terrestrial or air domain. So uh, the, the complexity of air, sea, land, cyberspace means lots of sensing. These uh, autonomous vehicles need to be aware and uh, situationally aware, uh, given the complexity of this potential future engagement shown in slide eight. So if we uh, think about the, those difficulties, yes, there's complexity, but what's even more challenging uh, is cyberspace. So there are levels of attack, and I like to uh, call the Stuxnet class Advanced Persistent Threat Organization, or, or APT, as a uh, indicative of the kinds of challenges that our autonomous systems will have to deal with in the future. So Stuxnet wasn't just a denial of service uh, malware that would go in and make the uh, Iranian centrifuges um, stop working. 
because they would figure out how to fix it and that would be the end of that. Instead, this Stuxnet APT was much more sophisticated and instead created malware, which was on the left side, the operators saw uh, life is good, <laughs> the centrifuges are doing just fine. Step seven has the modified code in the middle and this DLL shown in red in the center uh, was really the uh, malicious entity that had replaced the standard DLL. Uh, and uh, occasionally um, it was accelerating the centrifuges to 120% of rated speed and then taking it back down again and doing it often enough to where a centrifuge with maybe a normal, normal five-year life cycle would uh, only last a couple of few months. And then uh, with hundreds of centrifuges, you have lots of them breaking and what's going on here. So I would hate to be an operator or an engineer around all these centrifuges that are uh, falling apart and breaking, uh, especially not in Iran. The layering of code in the internet makes uh, APT, uh, Stuxnet class APTs um, more ubiquitous. There are many opportunities for zero day attacks. In fact, uh, on this slide, uh, I, I call it uh, with seven layers, you get 10 to the seventh attack surfaces because it's an exponential relationship. It's actually worse than that, and I'm gonna explain that in a couple of minutes. But you see, at, at the bottom, we always have the hardware, and the computing is based on the, the registers and memory and cache and all of that that the operating system orchestrates into doing uh, good things that virtual machines and code libraries need. And then as you go up further, uh, JVM, Java Virtual Machine, provides some portability. The new scripting languages provide uh, greater, uh, quicker integration, shortened time to market. And then at the top, we have uh, uh, people or uh, facing uh, entities like uh, HTML. So uh, browser-oriented browser dashboards are very popular because with languages at the top that are leveraging all those layers below, uh, you can deliver um, product to market very quickly. Because of the cyber situation over the past couple of three decades, hardware roots of trust became uh, espoused and uh, evolved in it and, and have, have been around with us for a while. The TPM is, I guess, the most common type of um, hardware root of trust, but every uh, computing, uh, you know, bootloader and all that have some kind of uh, hardware, hardware root of trust. Um, some are more sophisticated than others. In any event, we definitely know how to encrypt data that's uh, in motion. So wireless and wired are shown in gray and blue because uh, we've done a pretty good job of encrypting data in motion, although uh, WPA and some of these wireless uh, standards have had some holes that had to get repaired. In addition, hard drives are fairly easy to encrypt, and we've gotten pretty good at that. Um, however, computing still, uh, the data has to be, instructions have to be decrypted in order for, <coughs> excuse me, in order for the uh, computing to compute. Air Force Research Labs has developed something called T-Core, which is a DOD unique chip, and this, uh, this chip has a uh, uh, it encrypts um, memory. The processes are um, associated with the chip are uh, highly trustworthy, so that a an instruction that purports to be part of a process has to present a signature and so forth. So uh, DoD, this isn't the only DoD unique chip. Uh, an important feature of these chips is that they can run a traditional operating system and uh, code. So the uh, uh, computing dimension here is uh, improving in, in terms of cybersecurity. But <clears throat> are we there yet? And the answer is really no. And we're still very far away from <clears throat> cybersecurity for the von Neumann stored program CPU architecture. Now, some of you have heard me give this part of the talk before. I described it at DiveSpan last fall, and uh, it's, it was uh, an eye-opener for me, so I, I share it regularly. 
Register machines uh, are of the type shown in the upper left there. So the blue square is circling the registers of an Intel i4 instruction set architecture. Those registers are indicated along the, the top line as R0, R1, R2. So when initially powered up, the registers are in state R0, and then they go to state R1 and so forth. And it's a very large number. So at a, a, you know, a billion instructions a second, after a couple of hours, you've really logged a lot of instructions. The computer security people, uh, theory of computing uh, folks have a, uh, an approach to characterizing the degree of protection that's provided. So monitor functions are a theoretical construct that we approximate by actually building hardware and software. And what a monitor function does is it looks at the values of the registers to determine whether they're safe or not. So on the top line, monitor unsafe uh, number one uh, says, nope, it's not unsafe. Nope, it's not unsafe. So there are three zeros indicating safety because it's not unsafe yet. But then towards the middle, <coughs> there are three ones in a row, so it has become unsafe. Now, a truncation monitor, uh, as soon as it saw the unsafe state, would terminate the process and you're done. Other monitor functions may look for more uh, and, and may uh, characterize the degree of unsafety and may do other things. But in any event, uh, that would be a, uh, a binary uh, uh, vector indicating the degree of safety of that evolution of instruction. But of course, given uh, input, output, and other uh, uh, characteristics, the, the traces may be different. And so uh, you have to have lots more monitor functions for unsafe and also for safe operations. And so if we had all of the monitor functions for safe and unsafe, would we have complete, perfect cybersecurity? Well, lots of our uh, software and uh, cybersecurity brethren that are into risk management and so forth uh, seem, certainly seem to think so. And there are billions of dollars worth of software tools that approximate these monitor functions to, uh, uh, to keep malware out and, and all of that. However, there is, it's, it's uh, impossible to have all of the monitor functions. So you can never know when a von Neumann register machine is safe or not. And the reason is because of the mathematical structure of this type of computing. Uh, in particular, the evolution of registers from R0 to R1 to R2 <clears throat> is exactly like the evolution of integers from zero to one to two to three and so forth. Given a, any integer, I, I can say, well, what's the next integer in the sequence? And you just add one to the least significant bit. So if it's 10 digits long and it ends in a four, you know that the next one is gonna end in a five and have the identical same 10 digits. The, uh, that's a recursively enumerable sequence, RE sequence, and uh, in 1839, the question came up, well, we have the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, uh, and we have subsets of the natural numbers. Is it possible to have the power set, the set of all subsets of the natural numbers? After all, if we had all the monitor functions shown on the left, then we'd have the power set of the sequences because we'd know the safety or lack thereof of all the possible evolutions of the registers. And what Georg Cantor did was he said, well, uh, let's assume we have them all and let's go down the diagonal and, and we're gonna create a new sequence. In the first uh, one, one position, if the uh, first monitor function is a zero, we're gonna make it a one and, uh, and then we're gonna go to the next one. And so in the, in the two, two position, if the second monitor function in position two is a one, we're gonna make it a zero and so forth on down the diagonal. So basically you just flip the diagonal. And you say, well, we have a brand new sequence. Is this bitmap <clears throat> known? After all, we assumed it was. So if it was, it must be in there somewhere. Is it the first one? Nope, because it's different at least in position zero, zero. Is it the second one? Nope, because it's different at least in position one, one, and so forth on down. So the real proof is more, more complicated than this, but uh, it, 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 
this is the basis for uh, the full treatment. What this means is that it is impossible to have a complete set of monitor functions. Uh, the, uh, it's the recursively enumerable nature of the registers that's killing you. So I presented this to one of the, uh, I sent a paragraph to Professor Carl Landwehr at the National Science Foundation when he was in charge of theory of computing. He uh, gave me the names of, he said, I think your proof looks pretty good, but it was just a paragraph. Go talk to one of these folks. So I picked one of them who will remain nameless. Cause, <laughs> uh, so we got together and through the proof and I said, he said, so uh, after I'd, you know, got, to get going on the proof and he said, uh, I said, so this proves that cybersecurity is mathematically impossible for uh, a um, von Neumann architecture. And he said, and I quote, everybody knows that. <laughs> kind of like the, the halting problem of Turing or whatever. It's one of these fundamental limits. Well, I was kind of aghast and I said, look, if everybody knows that cybersecurity is impossible for register uh, machines of, of the uh, von Neumann architecture type, then why are we throwing billions of dollars uh, into that black hole? And uh, that led to a discussion of alternate architectures. And so on the next slide, I show uh, the outcome of that uh, dialogue. So on the left, we have commercial off the shelf and government off the shelf. And, uh, and you see the registers and register reuse and the OS and, the, and the, the stack and all the rest of it. And the malware, because there is no way to completely determine that there's no malware in, a, in, a, uh, in that type of a CPU. However, on the right side, we have a pure data flow machine where there's a register that's dedicated to the input. There's a, 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 a follow-on register that's dedicated to TCP data and out of TCP data, extracting the user IP address and then the get request. So this is a get machine because it recognizes GET and it will deliver the data on that website if you express the get request. The mechanism on the right is typically implemented with a field programmable data array. And in fact, if you're using the cloud, uh, most of the computing today in clouds is actually performed by data flow machines to the right. They're called accelerators. And uh, it wasn't an accident that Intel bought Altera. And uh, so the clouds are buying up these FPGAs because as shown on the right, 40 watts of power versus 150 watts to do the same uh, functions on the left. The mm, motivation for cybersecurity is also that on the left, we have hundreds of thousands, uh, over 100,000 100, common vulnerabilities and exposures for the register machines on the left. And then on the right, we have basically zero CVEs for uh, zero CVEs for uh, the pure data flow machine. Now, it's not zero cybersecurity because you still have the problem of uh, insider threats and the problem of supply chain. So there could be some nastiness in your FPGA uh, and, um, and all of that. But um, zeroizing these network attack surfaces is an important contribution. And to see if it would actually work, I built one in 2014 kind of as a demo site AccuTechnologies.com. If all hundred of you visit it in the same second, uh, it will uh, slow down. It's got a timer, and it will say, "Uh-oh, my rate of uh, get requests just went through the roof. I'm probably in a DDoS attack, so I'm going to start sending Finax uh, to end the sessions right away." Um, but uh, uh, I built one. It's it's been the same hardware has been online since 2020. It's been attacked from based on IP addresses, been attacked from Russia, China, Tor, a bunch of bots, and so forth. And because of it being a data flow machine that recognizes gets and responds to them and doesn't do anything else uh, other than what's needed for, for TCP, uh, it has never had any of its contents uh, altered by an unauthorized third party. On slide 16, I'm uh, showing a real COTS product. Mine was just a little demo machine. 
And uh, direct stream sells the real thing. The RAM is encrypted. Applications logic is in the applications layer, and it works just like in the prior slide. The, they also have, however, a control plane which orchestrates and configures the applications logic, and the control plane is uh, highly protected. And the entire thing has um, uh, tamper resistance as well. So it's a great product. There are many of them, and as I said, clouds are full of data flow computing. So I believe over the next few years, the CPUs and operating systems and all the stuff shown on the left, which we build uh, software with today, will still be there and will be useful for creating apps. But then the mapping of those applications to network FPGA microservices will be the really, uh, a really important um, trend and evolution because when you do that, then there are these uh, guarantees that safety uh, can be uh, de determined by having a monitor function. You go back here uh, on the right-hand side, we've got the, uh, each of these registers has data that can be um, tested for safety by simple things like re uh, regular expressions and so forth. So there, it's very straightforward to provide complete, consistent um, data checking in the architecture on the right it's mathematically impossible for the architecture on the left. <clears throat> Therefore, the systems engineering of autonomous cyber physical systems, those that are gonna go kaboom, uh, need hardware cyber hardening. And while uh, T-Core and those kinds of steps are important steps in the right direction, the mix of that level of capability with data flow and with other uh, mechanisms, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, uh, needs to be um, developed. It's, it's not well understood. It's just kind of emerging. The network environments within which these future autonomous systems will work are indicated by uh, the evolution of 4G to 5G, where we have, you know, this is the typical uh, spider chart on slide 19. Um, I'm not going, uh, this is just for reference. And then on slide 20, you can see the physical infrastructure at the bottom some of which I believe will be evolving to pure data flow on the bottom, because when you do that, then you can trust the massive machine type communications at the next layer up that's, that's uh, built in uh, in uh, network slicing. And then the ultra reliable low latency comms needed for uh, supporting autonomous vehicles, such as the one shown on the left here, that can be layered in. And then on the top, we have enhanced mobile broadband for immersion and uh, video and a smart doorbell and all that kind of thing. So the commercial sector is investing heavily. The uh, an important feature for us in in the CERC and um, interested uh, parties includes is is kind of highlighted I think on this slide number 21 where we have latency on the left starting with a millisecond at the top and going on down to uh, a second uh, at the bottom, and then bandwidth going from left to right with a gigabit a second uh, kind of below autonomous driving. So to get to autonomous driving, su support for autonomous driving by smart roads and so forth requires millisecond class um, uh, ultra reliable low latency communications at a gigabit a second. And then you can see these other applications shown. So the autonomy then becomes distributed and the trustworthiness of the autonomy is a function of the trustworthiness of the device itself and the mobile edge computing and the rest of the network. So in this slide, we have self-aware autonomy on the left and then agile networks with Mac uh, mobile edge computing or uh, multi-tenant edge computing, um, more or less the same thing and defensive cyber operations so that with the core and the cloud, we can have a trustworthy enterprise. To get there, however, uh, requires some real systems engineering. So the first is that pure data flow is really countercultural. Now for radio engineers like me and many of you out there, uh, the, uh, uh, it's not so countercultural. Everybody, uh, most people on the call probably know MATLAB and with uh, MATLAB you can have um, Simulink. Simulink is a block diagram language, and when, you're, um, when you've uh, drawn the block diagram flow, 
you can tell it you can tell it to map to an FPGA and it will um, compile uh, kind of cross compile from its block diagram language into the FPGA. There are uh, lots of tools from Synopsys and others that will uh, enhance and improve the uh, quality of the uh, FPGA uh, bitmap used to be that uh, the initial FPGA bitmap was off by an order of magnitude. Now, uh, hand optimization versus the current generation of cross compilers, uh, you might get 20 or 30%, uh, but not the big X factors that we used to get. So CPUs are great at design time, but not at runtime. Uh, mapping uh, from the design time MATLAB Simulink or whatever your block diagram programming language happens to be uh, into the FPGA uh, is a uh, cross compiling type process. DirectStream has one and there are others out there. If DOD could get somehow uh, maybe uh, stimulated by the CERC to get greater support into the data flow ecosystem, I think we would do well. Right now we're looking at 5G and how can we have trustworthy 5G when Huawei is putting back doors into everything that they sell? And so perhaps um, data flow and 5G could come together and uh, be complementary. Systems engineering, however, uh, requires more than that. So systems engineers tend to uh, embrace and uh, validate requirements. How do we require an entity to be self-aware or, uh, or, and have domain, domain specifics associated with the actual hardware uh, that's going to go do something as the devices an angel has fallen or others that uh, you all have been doing research with? It's how can we come up with a hardware-based machine DNA so that if the cell phone that I'm talking from, uh, it would know when it's sold to me, this is a... Uh, machine DNA, and I am Joe's phone, and, uh, you know, it's important to get uh, uh, voice quality and stay connected uh, for at least the next couple of minutes until I'm done. Um, so uh, th those are practical uh, situations. In addition, engineering multi-sensor awareness into these autonomous systems seems crucial. So a few years ago, it was in the press that a uh, U.S. drone had been downed in Iran by GPS spoofing. If that drone had had visual awareness, so it may have been an imagery drone and it was flying around to take pictures of things, if it had visual awareness, then it could look outside and say, hmm, GPS is telling me I'm home or I need to land, but it uh, doesn't look like it outside the window. What about dead reckoning? Have I flown far enough? <coughs> excuse me, to where landing makes sense. If you combine dead reckoning, visual awareness, and GPS, this would make GPS spoofing much more difficult, so we'd be able to trust this autonomous systems to a greater degree. Can we take this kind of thought process from that little example and apply it to mission-critical requirements? Uh, I, th I think so. To do that, we're going to have to have an architecture as shown on slide 24. To me, architecture is functions, components, and design rules. So the functions are the enduring things that we want it to do. And I believe that an enduring function of an autonomous system, especially a weapon system or uh, support infrastructure for DOD, should be self-aware, user-aware, and also aware of the social environment. So if you think of those 100 drones in Angel, if uh, you know three or four of them got together and only one did a kamikaze on a particular target, while the, other, the others didn't. Were the others doing relaying? Were the others more video capable? Why would, uh, what's the sort of social dimension among these autonomous entities? What about the component specifications? I would argue that we ought to demand hardware that's sub-touring and <clears throat> uh, uh, either data flow or the computational equivalent so that we can trust it. Uh, and so that we don't have uh, uncountable attack surfaces as we do today in the CPUs where we are just caught static. Uh, design rules. So uh, in order to allocate functions to components and to have components come and go as we need, software and hardware components, while we have these enduring functions at the systems level, 
uh, such as uh, you know land, sea, air, and space uh, um, entities, that we're going to need to clarity of uh, allocation of uh, IETF class clarity. And right now we don't have um, OODA loops computational architectures that have that kind of clarity. I believe that we can get there, and when we do, we'll discover that the microservices, you know, one page of code, uh, it goes back to structured design of the 80s and 90s where uh, smaller is better and orchestrating lots of small things together has uh, advantages for managing complexity and for delivering product uh, on time. So the systems engineering opportunities that I see uh, in, include academic demonstration of trustworthy autonomous systems. So I talked about my cell phone a minute ago. An autonomous cell phone would be very invasive of my privacy. It would know who I am and what I do and it would assist me with everything that I needed from mobility and banking to fitness and health. But it would not tell the network or anybody else what it learned about me. How do we make that happen? Uh, I think we could uh, develop some OODA loop architectures. My first OODA loop in my cognitive radio was a oop dal loop, observe, orient, plan, decide, act, and learn so that uh, we have a fully capable uh, integration, integrated AI and machine learning architecture. I use case-based reasoner and uh, some other relatively simple AI and machine learning in my work 20 years ago. Uh, we have lots more capability today. So I think the future is uh, bright. I think um, global collaboration may be uh, warranted because after all, if our weapon systems get hacked, uh, you know, who, who, uh, who, who's doing the hacking? Attribution can be extremely difficult. And uh, so maybe global militaries have more to gain by collaboration than not. Uh, I mean, you always got to keep something uh, to yourself <laughs> so that you have a competitive advantage uh, as we do in industry and so forth. But uh, perhaps uh, at this early research level, there might be some opportunities for global collaboration and perhaps uh, to help set research directions. So with that, uh, I'll conclude and thank you very much for your time and attention. Barry? Oh, there we go. Okay, any questions? Amy, you had some on the chat. I posted questions on Q&A, not on chat. Sorry, I meant Q&A. Amy, are you gonna run through those? Pardon me? I'm asking. Oh, sorry about that. I was uh, muted on the module still. There you <laughs> go. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, Jack, you had mentioned your, your first um, Q and, um, message in the Q&A seemed more of a comment than a question, but you, you mentioned only humans can trust. Systems uh, must be trustworthy, and you were going through what trustworthy entails. So I don't know if you wanted to elaborate further. Well, I made those assertions so that uh, he could say whether or not he agreed with them. Uh, so. Oh, excellent. This so, question uh, sometimes can be misinterpreted. So I just, my, what I would like to know is, uh, are, are my assertions here uh, acceptable or not? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Um, I I read through them quickly because that was the first uh, 
uh, note that occurred, but I haven't, uh, I, by, my, with my screen sharing, I can't go back and look at them more closely. From what oh, I understood, I, can, I agree I can, completely. I can, I can read ahead. through if you, if you like. The, the first assertion of, of what trustworthy entails uh, that Jack mentioned was clarity to stakeholders regarding system purpose and state. And then the second assertion was persistent assurance of zero defects, uh, essentially quality in the deployed system, particularly that any relevant defects be detected and resolved prior to the next involvement, uh, uh, reference to OODA. Um, and this recognizes that systems that learn and evolve are autonomous um, and the hazard function to both hackers, 20% uh, slackers, 80%. Uh, slackers due to inefficient standard of care as in quality management. Yes, so, uh, yeah, thanks. I agree completely, and I loved your hackers and slackers uh, uh, analogy. The, um, the, the, the reason that I included this proof of the uncountability of attack surfaces for general purpose CPUs is that uh, we need to manage complexity. And by minimizing the, uh, the, 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 relation, the complexity of the relationship between the software and the hardware, I think that we can have um, more rigorous testing by um, testing modules that are smaller, that are much easy, uh, easier to understand. And then by networking these uh, in collections would be comparable to the layers of software but instead of having some malicious agent be able to simply offer uh, an attachment to email, that which, which then would become part of your executing system, that actually wouldn't be possible because the bitmaps would be managed by the control plane and the applications plane would contain the bitmaps that represented the code that you approved to actually be there. And so as data is flying through the system, and it's interpreting things and learning, it's learning in the way that you prescribed it to learn until there's a conscious uh, effort to uh, action to update the learning machine itself. And so I think the amount of uh, hacking would be, uh, the, the opportunities for malware to enter the system, uh, certainly by, by the network would go to zero as I described, but then if there are logic flaws in the data flow machines that uh, cause uh, bad things to happen, then uh, that also has to be watched out for. And that becomes a, the subject of uh, the lower level specification and testing. So yes, I think the human side of this is very important. What is it supposed to do? And then for us to write requirements to characterize what is it supposed to learn and not learn, we have to go beyond what, what was it, Asimov's rules or you know, iRobot and all that kind of stuff and get to, okay, for this particular weapon, <laughs> this particular little UAV out of Angel has fallen, uh, what do we want it to do and what, what are we not going to allow it to do? And on a permission basis, what are we going to allow it if it's ours? And then how do we defend against these kinds of things? So I, I think uh, uh, your, your points are spot on, and I don't know what the answer is, but it looks like an important area for uh, further um, rigorous development. I strongly suggest, thank you for this, but I strongly suggest that we revisit the Multix system produced by MIT and GE back in the 1970s, because it was <laughs> immune to most of the difficulties that you're addressing. And, uh, yeah, so actually I do go back to Multix and uh, I wasn't there when Jack Dennis proposed uh, data flow, but I did read up on some MIT stuff from back then. And uh, if uh, one is rigorous uh, about the structure, then uh, you can create a system. Uh, and, and there have been some other pure data flow systems that have been developed for the Navy did one uh, at DiceBand, some colleagues uh, uh, briefly uh, explained it, um, but uh, so as long as you have register reuse, there will always be more attack surfaces than you can enumerate, and therefore, uh, even though Multics was a great OS, it was a shared register-oriented machine. Lessons learned from that experience and from what really worked 
should be applied to future data flow architectures. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, then Rich, you're able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question, Lev. Um, but it's in the Q&A saying, at one point, uh, I seem to remember that data flow machines had some issues with determinism. Is that still an issue? Uh, so, um, in when I'm describing the data flow machine that I've presented, a lot of times I call it a pure data flow machine because, they, like I said, data flow has been around since Mac. And although uh, there was, um, I think of Jack Dennis uh, because he was one of the leaders, with, uh, along with von Neumann at that time, trying to come up with the Sage uh, ground environment. Uh, the there have been lots lots and lots of work on data flow machines. And um, the uh, determinism is a function of the next level of mathematical structure. So if you have a purely uh, Turing equivalent machine uh, and you, you want to provide Turing equivalence, then you have the halting problem and the determinism problem and all of that comes to bear. So you have to have uh, now, Turing equivalent basically means that uh, its search is open-ended. You can do something for as many times as you want, and there are no restrictions. Uh, Sub-Turing includes machines that will, will do a certain number of operations, like maybe uh, iterate over the size of the database, but that's a number that's prescribed before you give the algorithm the opportunity to go work on things. And so, therefore, the lack of determinism can be uh, avoided by uh, understanding. Uh, I, I think we need to bring the theory of computing folks that understand Turing equivalence and uh, monitor functions and all that together with the engineers who are doing the computer engineering of the uh, computing and the systems so that we can avoid these uh, uh, pitfalls that have been demonstrated in the research literature. And so that's a, that's a very good question. And the answer is uh, yes, it's a problem if you use Turing equivalent data flow. Uh, and it's an avoidable problem if you do the systems engineering uh, that I'm uh, hoping that we'll get to. But Super. yes, you can do, you can avoid it. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Uh, and then, Amir, you're able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question directly. Um, but just to reiterate, uh, you asked, are there issues of scalability to concern us? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so did you want to uh, elaborate, Amir? I'm dealing with situations here where the, the, even at the edge, at the edge, there are devices now that, have, that do a lot of work. and. Um, I do know something about data flow machines, but uh, uh, when we dealt with them, there was uh, constraints about how many virtual paths can we envision simultaneously running to complete functions within a, a hard real time, you know, kind of deadline. Yeah, absolutely. So the scalability uh, is a is a challenge. I think the path to increase scalability is coming from really from 5G and from networks. So we have such network density and such network reliability right now that we can do Zoom and we can do uh, these phone calls. And I, I was actually doing some walking around while I was talking uh, here in the hotel room. And so uh, there's uh, the networking, the reliability and the bandwidth of the networking are making it such that instead of having to do everything at once on the same machine or be limited by, okay, here's my FPGA, what if I fall off the chip? That's a problem. Well, to scale up, you have to have thousands to millions of such FPGAs. Cloud computing is getting us there. The warehouse scale computers, and I know uh, some proprietary details of several of them because of a defense science board task force that I was on, and, uh, but trust me, they, are, they have uh, this in hand. So I believe that if we uh, pursue scalability, not, not as a thing of 
uh, I have a, a, a data flow machine that I've got to somehow figure out how to, how to deal with hardware, software, and data flows and all that. But if I think of a data flow network and how can I have the data that's moving along, you know, encrypted in motion, uh, decrypted when it gets to where it needs to be operated on, but only decrypt part of it, and then uh, send it off to its next location. I think uh, content-defined networking or uh, information-centric networks, ICNs, uh, they're showing that the load on the systems can be very, very low uh, compared to uh, strictly TCP IP types of things. So I think we can bring these things together and really make progress against that uh, problem, Amir. But that's a, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that link. Oops, apologies for that. Uh, Jim, you're unable to unmute if you wanted to ask your question, which I think tied into another point, Joe, that you were making. Um, Jim said, I'm wondering about the requirement for self-aware components. Doesn't self-awareness imply that you've become a Turing machine? <laughs> okay. So, uh, no, self-awareness does not require you to be a Turing machine. In fact, uh, there's an entire branch of linguistics called uh, cognitive linguistics. And this guy, uh, George Lakoff, wrote the book Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things back in the 80s as a, uh, a version of his doctoral thesis. And he, he showed that, um, and, and the cognitive linguistics folks have also shown that um, our uh, ability to relate uh, words and experiences um, begins very early. Uh, we can count to three when we're just a few days old. Uh, meaning we can tell the difference between one thing, two things, and many things. That's counting to three uh, if you're, <laughs> you know, not able to use the numbers one, two, three. And, uh, and language is built on uh, physical things first uh, and then relationships of physical things to each other. So we crawl uh, under the chair. Under is a uh, place. And so places and then paths or sequences of places. So if mommy yells, dinner's ready, the two-year-old, or maybe the, the eight-month-old realizes, that, unless this is the end of the call, I'll tell oh, No, sorry, that was a interference on somebody's unmuted line. <laughs> okay, okay, no worries. Uh, so uh, the, the, the person who, uh, the, the little kid who can't speak yet can, in fact, uh, recognize, okay, so uh, mommy called for dinner. I'm in my bedroom. Uh, and if I uh, crawl from the bedroom to the hallway to the living room to the kitchen, food. <laughs> so the path between bedroom, hallway, living room, and kitchen uh, is the next construct that we appear to acquire as uh, we're acquiring language. And then uh, actions, I can sit here and think about it or I can go and get something to eat. So uh, actions are built on uh, paths, and then causes are things like mommy saying dinner's ready, and that uh, in, uh, initiates or shapes an action. So those are required. Uh, Turing equivalents of unlimited search, we, we basically don't do that. When you study cognitive linguistics, you discover that people, uh, we are very good at uh, realizing when to stop, and Turing machines do not stop. They have uh, semi-infinite tape, and they'll use up the whole thing, and they will never produce an answer, which is what the halting problem is uh, for some inputs. So uh, people are definitely sub-touring. Now, societies and so forth, uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, but at least um, the, if you follow cognitive linguistics and use that model as, okay, I want my I want my UAV or my fighting vehicle or my, you know, smart uh, unmanned surface ship to be at, at least as smart as a three-year-old uh, or maybe n not a teenager. My my uh, <laughs> my daughter was great till she got to be a teenager. So we don't, we don't want we don't want uh, too many uh, teenage uh, fighting vehicles or uh, uh, but we do want them to be smart enough to. Uh, know what they can do and can't do and to go and do it for us. So uh, that question about uh, self-awareness, uh, self-referentially consistent 
uh, is my hardware DNA question. Uh, that that's that's a key challenge, and I don't know of anybody who's really even researching it all that seriously. But I think it's uh, time to uh, try to uh, excite some academic uh, folks about taking a closer look into that. Great point. I I appreciate the analogy too. <laughs> um, Rona. Tenbrecht uh, asked a question. You talked about trustworthiness distributed across the system. From the autonomy being distributed across devices, networks, et cetera, do you think distributed trustworthiness will cause different trust relationships between humans and machines? For example, do you see this as a changing, uh, as changing to a team relationship, uh, human more than one machine, rather than human agent per machine agent relationship? So, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I think the more that we can simulate uh, highly autonomous machines and give uh, and reduce the bandwidth between the machine and the rest of the world, the better off we'll be because, uh, you know, people have huge amounts of computing and the, the data rate that we have for expressing what we're thinking is uh, pretty small, uh, 64 kilobits a second. <laughs> Last time I looked at a voice channel, uh, there is body language and there are uh, other means of communication, but, uh, uh, but, but we do an awful lot of computing for recognizing things. And so I think having autonomous entities that have relatively low bandwidth uh, interactions with people will result in human interfaces that are more like what uh, what we need, because I think having highly computationally capable autonomous devices and entities that can communicate on a, almost a peer basis with people will allow for team forming and for recognition of capability. So, you know, um, Tom McDermott and I compared notes uh, before the call got going about uh, a, a study that we were on. So now, after that, my my uh, my mental model of Tom was updated significantly because I had actually um, wasn't thinking of that when uh, uh, until he brought it up. So I think that kind of shared mental model sort of thing uh, will become an important feature of human machine teaming. And for the people to come up with a very crisp, brief model of what that machine can do and can't do, uh, again, I refer back to Angel and Swallow and I'm like, okay, so how do those five vehicles do that? And what mental model of each other did they have? And, and you know, uh, so I, I think that's uh, an area for, uh, for uh, where simulation of uh, highly autonomous entities and people interacting could uh, benefit us quite a bit. Great point. And uh, Todd Chuck asked a question, um, and Todd, you're able to ask directly if you'd like. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Oh, okay. Yeah, this, um, this, I guess, real quick, uh, this is just uh, some research I'm doing with publishing actually on this topic, and this is some work that Charles Keating is doing in terms of complex systems governance, is that, you know, as we get to these more and more complex systems and systems of systems such as, let's say, you know, eventual autonomous vehicles, you know, let's say sharing the highways with uh, human piloted vehicles and that sort of thing. The question always is, and I'm a skeptic in terms of the ability to fully govern uh, these sorts of enterprises, uh, and looking at Ashby, and you know, his work in cybernetics would show us that you know we need to make sure we have enough diversity of response in order to counter uh, any form you know all these forms of inputs and problem spaces. And it gets you know it may be impossible to do so. So I'm just curious on what your thoughts are in terms of you know, how do we achieve uh, you know trust in systems and as systems and systems of systems become more autonomous. How does this work? I guess. Okay, great. So that's a really super question, and it takes me back to uh, complex adaptive systems. I got into it um, back in the 
1990s when, uh, <clears throat> you know, we had this situation where the Cold War is over. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> and fortunately, uh, a SecDef or CIA guy said we slay, slayed the dragon and out came a thousand snakes. So uh, complex, uh, uh, I think it was New Mexico State, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there were several researchers there, and I participated in a workshop uh, on complex adaptive systems, actually met Stu Kaufman, who was the at home in the universe uh, guy and uh, sponsored a, uh, a government workshop on complex adaptive systems in the, uh, in the uh, late 90s. The, uh, I think the math was, as is often the case, the math was ahead of reality. So complex adapt, adaptive systems mathematics of autocad autocatalytic systems, how are people and learning machines going to influence each other? There's, there's a lot of uh, math, which is uh, a stretch, for, or it was for me last time I looked at this literature, which was several years ago. Uh, how do you apply the complex adaptive systems math to the real world? Uh, I think, um, you know, cybernetics was was there way early and uh, looking far forward. Uh, I, so a combination of cybernetics as a foundational with complex adaptive systems as mathematical structures for, uh, um, for things like uh, social networks, you know, the, the degree of uh, connectedness and density of social networks uh, was tr was dealt with in this complex adaptive systems um, research literature back then, and now it's come to where uh, social networks like Facebook and so forth give us. Uh, we're living with it now, and uh, previously uh, it was um, it was not part of our daily experience. So as these things become part of our daily experience, we've got some great opportunities to bring these other dimensions of human experience and mathematics to bear on what we're trying to do here. I think, uh, you know, a workshop on uh, the hard math of complex adaptive systems and autonomy could generate some real insights. So thanks for that question. It's a great question. Um, and there, there's a couple other questions that I think uh, might take more of us uh, providing some information uh, in the follow-up email, um, but uh, Andrew Muxin asked if you could recommend good resources to get up to speed in this field. Uh, Barry Douglas asked about um, journal article references on the subject um, that you might be able to offer. Um, so I mean, sure, if you I'll have, to... sorry, go ahead. I'll be glad to do that offline. Perfect. Um, and then Jack had a, a few more questions, and Jack, you're able to unmute if you wanted to ask directly, uh, but one of the first new questions was, can you achieve scalability with stored program computers? Can you achieve scalability with stored, stored program computers? So uh, I'd, I'd have to get into a bit, I'd have to better understand what you mean by scalability, because today we have the cloud and we have, um, you know, millions of uh, airplane users, uh, uh, people who are traveling uh, using uh, the network for making reservations and uh, managing their air travel. We, we have, um, so that's a level of scale. Mm. And that's all done with uh, conventional stored program computing. So I think stored program computing, uh, CPUs and registers and all, all those layers in my, uh, you know, uh, here are um, pretty much the state of, uh, state of practice. You know, so there it is. And DevOps is contributing to um, reducing the amount of time that it, uh, that it takes to uh, get product to market. So, I, so that's a way of measuring scale. Um, the earlier question about, well, how will um, data flow achieve scale requires a more in-depth answer. And 
Uh, we're fi we're 15 minutes past the hour. hour. I'm not sure what the uh, timetable span was when we should be wrapping up. Yep, we're we're about 15 minutes past uh, wrapping up. So <laughs> if okay. anything, I can forge you over some of the the questions that um, we didn't have time to answer, and and uh, we can provide some follow up to our attendees. Uh, as we let them know that the recording from today's session uh, is available. Sure, and I'd be glad to follow up uh, emails, um, atola.joe at ensco.com, and uh, uh, we, we'd be glad to um, do what I can to help, help out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for attending and uh, bearing with our technical difficulties. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Talk, uh, which will be taking place on April 1st. So thanks again, everyone. Take care.